Greetings. It's a pleasure to be presenting again for this wonderful series, uh, today to discuss Paradiso 26. We find Dante still in the sphere of the fixed stars, finishing his colloquy about the virtue of charity with St. John the Apostle, whose radiance had blinded him in the prior canto. In my brief remarks today, however, I'd like to focus on Dante's encounter in the last 50 or so lines of this canto with Adam, the first soul which the first power ever created, as Beatrice describes him in line 82. Adam, of course, is the first human being, whose creation and rebellion against God are described in Genesis 1 to 3. Dante's conversation with him offers a striking meditation on the nature of human knowledge, particularly on how our desire for it goes wrong, and on the relation between self-knowledge and the knowledge of God. Dante greets Adam by flagging his hesitancy to ask him any questions, expressing confidence that Adam already knows what he wants to know. Adam replies that he can indeed discern Dante's wish more clearly even than Dante knows whatever is most certain to him, quote, because I see in the true mirror that perfectly reflects all else. Adam is not here referring to any kind of physical sight. Recall that he's still awaiting the resurrection of his body, the Last Judgment, but rather to a particular kind of understanding which he possesses by virtue of his immediate acquaintance with the divine essence, in what medieval theologians called the beatific vision, following St. Paul's promise in 1 Corinthians 13 that while now we see through a glass darkly, then we will see face to face. It was a scholastic commonplace, of course, that the saints in heaven, in beholding God with the eyes of their mind, see in his essence, all the effects which he brought forth in creation. In something like the way that if you could read the thoughts of an artist, you would come to know his artworks as well, even if you had never seen them in person. Adam knows what Dante wants to ask, not because he had read Dante's mind, but because he had caught a glimpse of Dante as he was known and loved by God, and so come to know him better than he knew himself. This allowed Adam to anticipate that Dante wanted to know uh, four things. Uh, first, uh, how long ago Adam was placed in the garden, uh, how long he spent there, how he sinned, and what language he used. I'll largely set aside the first two of these questions. Uh, Adam says that the earth is about 6,300 years old and that he didn't even make it a full day in the garden before being expelled. So far, so Augustinian. Adam's answers to the latter two questions, however, deserve to be unpacked a bit more. Dante wanted to know what was the particular character of Adam's sin. Now, for those of you who need a quick refresher on Genesis 2-3, to God had placed Adam, and eventually Eve, in the Garden of Eden, and told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest they die. Alas, after a conversation with a wily serpent, they did eat from it, and in consequence were expelled from the Garden and condemned to eventual death. Adam clarifies that it wasn't that the tree itself was somehow intrinsically bad for human beings. Rather, it was the mere fact of his and Eve's rebellion against God's command which got them the boot. Adam's particular phrasing here is quite important, however. What he specifically says is that it wasn't the, quote, tasting of the wood, lanio, that caused his exile, but rather the, quote, trespassing of the sign, trapassar il segno. Now, some of you might recall that I gave a presentation earlier in this series on Inferno 26, where Dante meets Ulysses, aka Odysseus, and learns how he had died after sailing with a small company around the world to the very foot of Mount Purgatory, at whose summit was located none other than Adam's own Garden of Eden. As I noted in that earlier video, there are a number of Quite striking parallels between Ulysses in Inferno 26 and Adam in Paradiso 26. In particular, Ulysses tells Dante that he and his companions had set sail on a single ship, or rather, oddly, wood, Lanyo, and had sailed out into the open ocean past the Pillars of Hercules in the Strait of Gibraltar, where, Adam notes, Hercules signed Seigneur the limit. These verbal parallels are not a coincidence. Rather, Dante is inviting his readers to recognize that Ulysses and Adam each illustrate what the medievals described as the vice of curiosity, the disordered desire for knowledge. Adam had sinned by transgressing God's command to avoid the knowledge of good and evil. Ulysses had been undone by his desire to know not only human value, but also our vices. But I say uh, enough about that in the earlier video. I mention it here 
uh, because these two kanti provide particularly striking illustrations of a more general pattern in the Commedia, whereby Dante develops structural or verbal parallels between the three cantiche, the Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. The effort to tease out these parallels is now often called vertical reading, and it's something of a growth industry in Dante studies, producing results which, though not always convincing, are often quite illuminating. Now Adam's response to Dante's fourth question is perhaps even more remarkable still. He observes that in the language he had spoken in Eden, which had gone extinct even before the confusion of tongues at Babel recounted in Genesis 11, God's name was E, the single letter I. After the fall, he says, it became L. This passage has long been an interpretive crux. Some readers, for instance, have argued that Dante meant E as a reference to the Roman numeral one, and so as an allusion to the divine unity. However, Christian Moves, in his The Metaphysics of the Divine Comedy, has shown convincingly that there is a different and subtler logic at work here. At the surface level, Adam's two divine names seem to invoke two biblical names for God. On the one hand, the first syllable, Yah, of the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, which God reveals to Moses as his personal name. And on the other hand, El, the generic Hebrew name for God or a God. Uh, and interestingly, this implies that Dante had at least some acquaintance with Hebrew, which was a rare attainment in his day. But there is a still deeper sense to Adam's observation about God's name. In the language of Eden, God had been known as E, a close approximation of the Italian Yo, I, the first person singular pronoun. Later, in Hebrew, God was known instead as El, Italian for He, the third person singular pronoun. In other words, Adam is hinting that knowledge of God in Eden had in some sense been equivalent to self-knowledge. As Augustine famously put it in his Confessions, God is not only superior sumo meo, higher than my highest, but also interior intimo meo, more inward than my inmost self. After the fall, God must be known as another than oneself because we have turned away from his light and so darkened our minds. To borrow again from Augustine, Adam left God but God had never left Adam. Dante's greeting to Adam at the outset of their encounter already subtly underscores this fact. He calls the first man an apple. In medieval tradition, as still today, the fruit plucked from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, was, was often described as an apple for the simple reason that the Latin malum means both evil and apple. Now Dante hints for us that the knowledge which Adam vainly sought outside himself was in fact self-knowledge, which is ultimately knowledge of God. Consider again Adam's description of his knowledge of Dante. In the vision of the divine essence, he says, he already knew Dante better than Dante knew himself. True self-knowledge, and a fortiori true knowledge of all other creatures, is to know oneself as one is known by God. That is the goal toward which the pilgrim Dante strains throughout the Commedia, and it is to that same goal that the poet Dante beckons us as well in this canto.